Rick Carter's Jurassic Park. The official history behind Jurassic Park's screenwriting process had always included Michael Crichton, Molly Scotch Marmo, and David Kep. Publications from magazines, documentaries, and the official making of book chronicled how screenplays went through the hands of all three writers, one after another. However, in March of 1991, a new script was quietly worked on for Jurassic Park by someone else. Rick Carter was Jurassic Park's production designer, who was involved before Crichton's first draft had even been completed. While the role usually isn't connected to elements of the story within the film's screenplay, this was a special case. A production designer's primary role is to create and manage the visual aspects of a film. This usually involves the look of sets, graphics, props, lighting, and costumes. Rick Carter explains, I was brought onto Jurassic Park about two years before we finally started shooting. At the time, the only other people involved were Steven, the producers, and Michael Crichton. The script had not been written. We were working from galleys of the books, so for me, it was a great opportunity to be able to actually help shape the film. On most shows, the production designer is brought in and handed the script and asked to visualize it. Not so on this one. I was in on many early meetings with Steven where we would break down the scenes in the book and discuss which ones would work best for the film. While Jurassic Park tells a fantastical story about the brilliance of genetic engineering and the dangers it can behold, it is also the story of a glorious theme park. The theme park is not only a part of the story, it is the central setting. If it doesn't come to life, if it doesn't breathe authenticity, then neither does the story. Rick Carter says, From a design standpoint, the stars of Jurassic Park are the dinosaurs. That's not to say that the characters aren't important, because they are. But on a visual level, the dinosaurs are the stars. And I think the island is very strong as a setting. So I really did not want to have the park be a lot of commercialized edifices that feel shallow and overly bright and overly energetic, even though that is something that the park would probably evolve into if it were finished. I thought, as a film, it would feel shallow. This is, after all, not Disneyland. What people would go to see in Jurassic Park would be the dinosaurs in their natural habitat, not a lot of man-made stuff. So for the first 10 years at least, it would probably be taken very seriously until somebody started making sideshow freaks out of the dinosaurs. I tried to make it look serious in the sense that the visitor center, for example, is like a temple for dinosaurs. The bas-relief bones that are seen throughout are like hieroglyphics of the earth, sculptures from the earth that tell a story. There are some very complex things going on in the control room and the labs that as a look, I felt it should be of one element, so that the concrete sense of one feels is that there is the jungle, and there are the dinosaurs. Interestingly, Carter was not big on dinosaurs before signing up for the project. Rick Carter goes on to say, I was never a big dinosaur nut while growing up, but I got into it. The joke for me was always that we are clearly the only form of life that has any interest in seeing dinosaurs come back. I'm sure there's a lot of rodents who, if they ever got wind of this idea, would go, what the hell are they thinking? Don't they remember what it was like? A visual guide with various artists, including art director John Bell, was quickly assembled by creating storyboards and other concept art. Once Crichton's first screenplay was produced, Carter had numerous notes of ideas and suggestions to further enhance the director's vision. He suggested altered scenes involving the dinosaurs and how they can more realistically be involved. Rick Carter explains, We try to find the animal in the dinosaur as opposed to the monster in the dinosaur. 
The idea was not to make them any less threatening, but rather to keep them from doing as much monster shtick. For our human characters, we wanted their situation to be more like they were being stalked by an animal that is a carnivore, as opposed to something that is psychopathic and just out to get them. It's interesting to note that some of these issues that Carter mentions, including trying to make the dinosaurs not appear psychotic, and his disdain for over-commercializing the park, ended up being a pretty big basis of Jurassic World. Jurassic Park was anticipated to be a success before a world-class filmmaker like Spielberg, there was of course pressure for it to be even more than that. Rick Carter says, We finally got it down to 55 million, and with all the pre-planning, we were actually able to make it for that. The development of the script went hand in hand with the production design, because both had to key off each other. We had to break it down into things that were doable without stripping it so badly that you didn't have a movie. Because you have to deliver on the epic level. I had to be more involved, because it became a question of whether the movie could get made. After Crichton had finished his final draft of the screenplay, the filmmakers knew they still wanted to finesse and enhance the story even further with someone else. Tom Stoppard, an esteemed playwright and screenwriter, was among the choices to take over Jurassic Park's script. Spielberg would go on to take a short break from Jurassic Park's production to film Hook, but everyone else continued to work. Rick Carter goes on to say, While Spielberg was doing Hook, I would go to him with all these different ideas of how to make things work. Only weeks after Crichton's time with the production had come to an end, Carter decided on a way to deliver these ideas to Spielberg in an unconventional way for a production designer. Steven and all of us were having such amazing conversations as we explored where the movie could go based upon Michael's book. And I knew Michael Crichton through my mother. So I already knew him as a person independent of all of this. So I knew what he was writing from his book and the conversation with Stephen. And we were developing all sorts of ideas for scenes and contexts that it was fine for him to do his version. But when it went to the next step, there was a Malia Scotch Marmo who was brought on and I wasn't part of those meetings. And I knew that many of the things that we were discussing were going through Stephen to her and that he was wanting to see what she would bring. But it was making it a little bit hard, as I remember, to know what to coordinate for the art department to focus on. I mean, we knew the main road attack would be there. We had to design the spitter, the spitter would be there. We knew it was a raptor pen. You know, we knew certain things, but there was a whole river extravaganza. There were a lot of things that were in the book that we were still playing out and exploring. So I wanted to get something that in front of Stephen that we could use as our working document. And I started to write sort of memos that would outline scenes and I'd throw images with them and that kind of thing. But it, it, it got to be where it almost was easier to do it as a screenplay form. And then of course, once I entered into that, I started just putting in dialogue and, you know, whatever, or whatever I took from the, 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 the book that I thought was still really good. He impressively assembled an entirely new script using much of Crichton's as the backbone, but with new ideas he gathered to give it blood and muscle. The script began with this introduction written by Carter. March 7th, 1991. After our last script meetings, I began collecting together my notes. I realized that the only way for me to see how the ideas might actually play out in the story was for me to collage them into Michael's latest script. Well, <laughs> one thing led to another and I found myself going through the entire story. I hope you will read this rough version of the script in the way it is intended. It is only designed to be a stepping stone or just another point of departure for Tom, or whoever you bring on to rewrite Jurassic Park. 
Most of the major changes are in the first third and the last third of the script. Rick Carter Out of all the scripts written for Jurassic Park, Carter's version is perhaps the most interesting. It begins to take Crichton's story and shape it into how the film would be finalized. At the same time, it includes an array of unique ideas that would either become extinct or resurrected in future films. Such ideas include John Hammond wanting to recruit Grant and Sattler to work at the park, the discovery of a raptor den secretly nestled far beyond their pen, trees that are deforested by the giant dinosaurs, and the occlusion of lava fields. There's even an umbrella designed to look like a spitter that is used as a distraction against a velociraptor, an idea similarly used in Jurassic World. It's not every day that a production designer writes a screenplay to get his ideas across in order to make the film a success. But Rick Carter was a special production designer. While his version of the script would not end up being used for the film, it wasn't his intent anyway. He simply wanted the best way to further continue the production progress of Jurassic Park, and he felt altering the script was the best way to do it. But what if it had been made? What would it have been like? Would it have felt just as grand, just as engaging, and just as memorable? Or would it have had its own unique flavor that no one else could have concocted. Now, prepare yourselves for the adventure ahead as you experience an illustrated audio drama featuring the film's original production artwork brought to life with fantastic music, sound effects, and the voice talents of enthusiastic fans.